Hi, I'm Larry Raymond with Cattle Parish Parks, and uh, we're looking at a Chinese tallow tree, which is an invasive tree uh, throughout Louisiana. Uh, pretty serious invader in South Louisiana and becoming more so up here in North Louisiana. We're finding more and more of the tallow trees in the Red River bottoms. And uh, the, the reason they're considered invasives is that they basically outcompete all of the native plants that are in the area. And uh, although there is some wildlife value to the tallow tree, birds will eat the, the white waxy berries that they produce. Uh, and of course, they, you know, they provide some cover for animals, for nesting areas and that sort of thing. Uh, they're not as good as, for habitat as the natives are. And typically, uh, the government, federal government and state governments will spend a lot of money trying to eliminate these types of invasive species from, from natural areas. So it can be quite expensive. And in Louisiana, tallow tree is one of the, the main invasives that we have to deal with. Okay, this is a Chinese privet, or a type of a ligustrum. Uh, again, this is one that, that's often sold in the horticultural trade, just like uh, the tallow tree is often sold in the horticultural trade. But it's considered highly invasive, and, and it's one that, uh, in our forested areas, will often outcompete all of the understory native type uh, shrubs and plants, and, and basically just take over. Now, the birds are desirable. I mean, the, the fruits, these little blue fruits are desirable for by the birds and they'll feed on them and oftentimes you'll find uh, privets growing along fences or the edges of woods where the birds will perch and, and when they defecate they basically plant the seeds and, and then they'll come up and again you've got some food value you've got cover you know uh, birds like brown thrashers and cardinals and things will nest in them but because they outcompete a lot of more desirable native trees uh, a lot of times we try to control these. I know I office at Walter Jacobs Nature Park and we actually have days where we get volunteers out there to help us get rid of the uh, privet so that we can open the area up for the more desirable natives to, to come in. Well in, in terms of, of a lot of the invasives one of the problems with them is, is they tend to take over areas uh, especially areas that have been disturbed like this and uh, what will often happen is you'll just wind up with a monoculture of, of just one species taking over the area and from a biodiversity standpoint that's really not desirable. Uh, most biologists would tell you it's much more desirable to have lots of different species so if something happens to one you've got others there that'll, that'll basically take its place and, and make up the difference. If you have just one species growing in a disease or something happens to wipe it out, then you've got nothing left in terms of habitat. This large oak tree that we're looking at that's still holding some of its leaves is called a water oak. And in North Louisiana, it, it kind of takes the place of live oak, which is more of a South Louisiana tree. Uh, it's not evergreen like live oak is, but it's what's called semi-evergreen. And it'll hold its leaves well into the winter uh, and usually replaces the leaves not all at one time, but over time it'll lose leaves and, and grow new ones. But it makes very small acorns that are very desirable to wildlife. Deer, squirrel, you know, raccoon, all of the animals, wood ducks that, that eat acorns are going to feed on those. This area uh, down here is, is pretty typical of, of the Red River bottomlands throughout Caddo Parish. And, uh, Roughly 28% or so of the parish, of cattle parish, is made up of, of Red River bottomland. Major tree species that you find in here are pretty typical of the bottomland going back for, for hundreds of years. Uh, cottonwood, willow, red maple, uh, box elder, uh, hackberry, some dogwood. Now, as you go up on the slopes, and get into more upland areas, then you'll start getting into some of the other types of, of oaks and hickories and pines that, that dominate the upland portions of Caddo Parish. If you see the, the tree that has the bark peeling off of it, uh, that's one I, I neglected to mention before that's also very typical of, of bottomland areas, but that's a, a sycamore tree. And uh, sycamores are another common overstory tree that you find along the Red River. So frequently the cottonwoods and the sycamores will be some of the tallest trees that you'll find in, in this type of area. And the sycamore leaf is, it's a simple leaf, but it's indented. Uh, 
in a lot of ways it reminds me of, of what a grape uh, vine leaf might look like. This is the leaf of a cottonwood tree and cottonwoods are usually the very tallest of the canopy trees along the river. Uh, they're in the same family as the willow trees and, and they produce a, a cottony type seed and I guess that's where they get their name cottonwood. Uh, but one of the things, I'm a, I'm a bird watcher in this area and, and we'll often come along the river in the summertime to find Baltimore Oriole Nest and some of the, uh, something called a warbling vireo. There are several birds that you find nesting in these real tall trees just along the river. Uh, specialty type birds that we'll come here to see. And typically, you'll find mandinas out in the woods. Uh, they can indicate one of two things. It, it could be that you'll find them near old home places, if you're close to where an old home site used to be. And like uh, uh, the privet that we talked about earlier, uh, the seeds and get spread by birds that feed on the berries. And, and when they defecate in various parts of the woods, they'll often plant the mandinas. I suspect a hole of that size is probably armadillo. Uh, of course, you know, the best way to confirm that is to actually see what's using it. But oftentimes things like armadillos will dig a hole, especially in the side of a, of a bluff like this, and then all sorts of things might use it, uh, and might use it together. You know, you might find a turtle living in a place like that, a snake, a salamander. There are just all sorts of animals that, that will use these holes that are dug by other animals. This hairy vine uh, is going to be one of two things, and, and I really can't tell just looking at this part, but the only two vines I know that, that are real hairy like that are poison ivy and Virginia creeper. And I usually advise people to stay away from the hairy vines uh, unless they find the leaves and can confirm which one it is. Uh, I suspect that this one is going to be a muscadine grape. And muscadine grape is one of the common native grapes that grow out here and, and produces a, you know, a purple grape that's about the size of a nickel. It's, uh, again, an excellent wildlife food. Uh, but, of course, people can use it, too. Uh, in fact, I've got quite a few muscadines that grow in my yard, and, and usually we'll pick them every year, and my wife makes a, a kind of a real tart muscadine pie out of it that's real good. Box elders in the maple family, it, it's a, basically a maple tree that has compound leaves. And it makes a, a winged seed like all of the other maples that are eaten by birds and other organisms. <clears throat> birds serve a lot of important functions, as, as do most of the animals that, that live you know, in the natural environment. But they're particularly important in dispersing seeds. Uh, some mammals also disperse seeds, but birds are well known for dispersing seeds because they'll frequently eat the berries and the fruits of trees that are fairly high up and, and not accessible to other organisms and then over time uh, you know they'll go somewhere else and when they defecate they plant the seed. Other birds like the insectivorous birds are important because they control insects. In bottomland areas like this where you have water and, and old oxbows from the Red River you know, you're going to find lots of egrets and herons and those types of birds that feed on fish and crawfish and frogs and those types of organisms that, that are just all part of, of you know, the food chain. Uh, and Louisiana in general is well known for the number of birds that, that we have. And a lot of people come to Louisiana to see birds. kids are either in front of a computer screen or a video game or a television and, and they don't get outside anymore. They, they don't have the experience of climbing trees, catching critters in, in the, you know, the local ditch and, and that sort of thing. And as they become more removed from nature, they have no incentive to want to save it. And that's something that, uh, especially those of us who consider ourselves conservationists are really concerned about because if people don't have uh, that emotional contact with the outdoors, they're not going to have a reason to want to save it. Of what's out here, they don't, they don't know what animals live around here and whether or not they're dangerous, and, uh, and so they just they basically stay away. This is a typical example of, of uh, the decomposition process that, that you find in nature, and there are lots of organisms that help to break down 
organic material like like woody plants when they die. Uh, and these types of, of fungi, sometimes called shelf fungi, uh, are some of the first ones to start growing in the wood and, and start breaking it down. And of course, if you were to break this apart, you'd find uh, pro probably lots of different types of wood boring insects that are in there and things that you can't see, like bacteria, are also real important decomposers. But over time, they'll basically recycle all of the nutrients in this tree back into the soil so that they can be reused. It's typical uh, of one of the trees I mentioned that, that's uh, a part of the bottomland hardwood forest, and that's hackberry, uh, sometimes called sugarberry, and it has these little corky growths that, that are on the bark. And hackberry is an important bottomland species. Uh, you often find as they get real large, and, and they will reach canopy size, uh, they'll often have cavities in them and large holes and stuff. So they become excellent uh, den trees for raccoons and possums and, and all sorts of other animals that live in them. And they produce a fruit that lots of organisms will feed on. Well, the, the armadillo is uh, uh, not really what I would consider uh, a non-native mammal, but it's one that's a recent arrival in this area that, that came up from probably South America through Texas uh, and then into Louisiana. And basically the only thing that limits its distribution is cold. Uh, I would suspect... Did you hear the fish crow? That, uh, it had that weird sound. Oh, a hundred and more years ago uh, for example, when Freeman and Custis had their expedition up the Red River, you know, they people write about the large, extensive cane breaks, and what they were talking about were areas of lots of this switch cane. been feeding on where they stripped away the, the shell of the acorn and you know, a squirrel or something looks like it's been gnawing on it. With frogs, it's, uh, they're much more sensitive to chemical disturbances and stuff in the environment, and they're often, amphibians are often the first animals to show a decline before it gets serious enough to affect larger animals. So, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of our canary in the coal mine, if you will, and that's why a lot of people are studying amphibians.